Amen. Are you ready for the word of God today? If you love our worship team, pastors Ben and Katie Wisner, come on, let them know how much you love them. Band, praise team. I haven't done this in a long time. Shout out to our camera operators, our sound guru, Mr. Justin Hall. Shout out to our screens operators, live stream coordinators, switchers, operators. Amazing job. Photography, videography, you guys are knocking it out of the park. Because just as many people in this room today, there are three to five times that many watching us online right now. And so we thank you for making Gulf Coast uh, your home abroad. All right. Hey, let's speak for just a few moments, not long, about four hours on the topic. (laughs) We might as well stay together. We're coming back together tonight. Come on. Let's just stay together and hang out. We'll give you hot dogs in advance. Uh, We want to speak for just a few moments um, uh, this morning on the topic, if. Somebody said, only you preaching. Why do you say we? Because without the help of the Holy Ghost, I'm not a very good preacher. And so we're going to preach today on the topic, if, I-F, if, 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 pastor doesn't preach long, I'll get to go to lunch early. If he doesn't make a big, long thing out of an altar call, then I'll get to have a nap today before baptism. If you keep asking those questions, I'll keep you longer. Okay, here we go. There are 1,595 ifs in the Word of God. If is a small word, yet encompasses a big possibility. I was studying Exodus 4. It's not on the screens, but I was was really diving deep in the life of Moses, and I found out that when God had called Moses in Exodus 3 at the burning bush to lead the children of Israel out of bondage, I found out that Moses did not always respond with great faith. In fact, it most often was the opposite of that. Moses responded with great fear and great doubt and great anxiety. And we find in Exodus 4, again, not on the screen, but I just want to share with you a little bit of my personal individual study. Uh, Moses has a dialogue with God. And God says, Moses, you are the chosen one to lead my people Israel out of bondage. Moses talks back to God, he has a dialogue, and and he says, God, but what if they do not believe me? What if they do not listen? What if I'm not able to accomplish all that you've called me to do? And God responds to Moses' what if by this statement. He says, Moses, what is? What is in your hand? He has the staff in his hand, and and God tells Moses, Moses, throw the staff down and watch it turn into a snake. He picks up the snake, and it turns back into a rod. That does not mean that your preacher is a snake handler, by the way. If you bring a snake in this place, I will run as fast as somebody that weighs 263.4 pounds as of this morning will run from this place. But the reality is all of our what-ifs usually... Uh, warrant a response from God that says, what is? God, what if you never heal me? And God says, what is something that I've done in your past? What if you never move? What is an area that I've moved in before? God responds typically to our what if questions by what is. The what if questions are life are always met with a what is statement from God. God is saying, what is something that I brought you out of? What is something that I've healed? What is something that I've spoken to in your life and changed and rearranged everything? We have a lot of if questions in our life. If I get the job, things could happen. If I step out in faith, mountains will move. If everything works out. If my kids get into that school. If I don't need Oreos late at night, I could have a six-pack. Oh, that's just me, my bad. If, 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 what if I never get healed? What if my children never get saved? What if I always struggle with this? If, these if questions are reverberating over and over in our minds. And and I believe those what if questions can turn into faith by saying, what if today is the day that everything changes? What if today is the day that your child begins to collide with their purpose and start serving God out of this experience today? What if my testimony sets everybody else free that's in bondage? What if? If is a small word 
filled with big possibilities. When God speaks to us and challenges us, we usually respond by God, but what if it doesn't happen? But today I want to challenge you off this foundational idea today. What if it does? It's hard for me in Strategic Plan 1.0 in the vision document because, you know, I've only been here about seven months now. And being here, I said, you know, God, I know you've given us a vision, but what if it doesn't work? And God responded to me and said, but what if it does? But God, what if we're not debt-free in 23? God says, but what if you are? But what if we don't raise enough money for the renovation? I'm going to look like a fool. And God says, but what if I do, and it's not about you anyway, knucklehead? What if? If is a small word full of big possibilities. I want to just speak for the internal dialogue, and I'll weave in and out of Scripture, Old and New Testament today, but I want to speak to the internal dialogue going on in and through our lives that what if it does happen or what if it doesn't happen? Is your life set up in such a way that if it does happen, you are prepared to live in that new reality? Let me ask that question again. It's rhetorical for the floor. But, but what if God does move and he does answer and he does heal and he does deliver and he does set free and he does save? Is your life set up in such a way that you'll be surprised or is your life set up in such a way that your faith will answer that door of opportunity and you'll live in the new reality all the days of your life? I'm convinced that we've insulated ourselves with the what if it doesn't happen mindset that when God does make it happen, watch this, we don't even recognize it. Could it be that God is giving you small answers for your big problem to see if you'll thank him on the minute level, on the, on, the, on the small level, to see if you'll praise him for the small stuff because if you're not faithful in the small, he's not going to make you roller over much anyway. Could it be that God puts in front of you a stone for you to step on and if you do that in faith, then he'll be able to move the big mountain that you're looking at. God rearranges things in our lives in such a way that it causes us to not rely on ourselves but rely fully on his word. Some of us have conditioned ourselves to think about the 10,000 ways that things won't or can happen, but God is asking you today, do I still move mountains? Do I still chase down the prodigals? Do I still own the cattle on a thousand hills? And am I still Jehovah Jireh? Do I know right where you are right now and nothing has caught me by surprise? Am I the God of all flesh and is there nothing too hard for me? Can I say this to you prophetically this morning? Your condition has not changed God's position. I'm going to say that again. Your condition has not changed God's position. The condition that you find yourself in, God has a recipe to reveal to you called revelation of who he is in your life. How you answer the ifs of life will change your life forever. Bible says this, 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. Are you ready? Somebody shout, I'm ready. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Somebody shout, if. Uh, that was all right for the church down the street. On three, somebody shout, if. One, two, three. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. Your answer to God's if can bring change and freedom to every place you walk and everything that you touch. God did not say, if my people worry, I will heal their land. If my, he did not say, if my people complain, I will heal their land. He did not even say, if my people come to church on a Sunday morning, I'll go ahead and heal their land. He didn't say that. He says, if you pray, I will heal. But pastor, what about the thousands of times that I've prayed and he's not answered? What about the one time that he did answer? Stand on that mountain and look at every other obstacle and say, I dare you to come against me in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody needs to get bold in their faith today to say, no matter what I'm facing, God is bigger than what I'm facing. 
Somebody needs to understand that you may have to face it, but you don't have to fight it because you serve a God who still moves mountains and still calls walls to fall. You may have to walk around it for a little bit, but one shout from your mouth like the children of Israel will cause the walls to begin to fall down in the name of Jesus. How many would declare that we serve a God who still moves mountains? Come on, give them a big praise in the house today. Pastor, uh, what if it doesn't happen? We are conditioned to go back to the default of what if it does not. There's a man whose son was demon-possessed, and he asked the disciples, he said, please, disciples, can you pray for my son who's demon-possessed? He gets thrown into the fire. He gets thrown into the water. I can't do anything with him. I'm going to have to turn him over to the local government. Can you please give me some help? I've tried everything else. What do you do when you've tried everything that you know how to do and you still come up short? Most often in our lives, even though we are baptized in faith and we love Jesus, Typically, when we are faced with an obstacle, we look to natural resources first, and we look to spiritual help second. What I'm saying is the what-if questions of life should grow and condition you to always look at Yahweh first and the other situations last. Are there help in the natural? Sure. But is the Holy Ghost a helper always? Absolutely, he is. There was a man whose son was demon-possessed, and he asked his disciples, hey, Can you help me out? The Bible says that the disciples could not help. The born-again believers could not do anything. The Sunday attendees could not do much. And so the Bible says this father went to Jesus. He was desperate. Have you ever told somebody else about your situation? Have you ever looked at other people and thought to yourself, man, They look like they can solve it, but they were not able to solve it. And then you resorted to the reality that there is only one that can get you out of your situation. And his name is Jesus. This man said, I have to get to Jesus. Mark 9, we pick up the text, three verses. It says, four verses rather. He asked his father, Jesus did. He said, how long has your son been in this condition? And he said, of a child. It's been a long time, Jesus, and I need your help. I've asked your church. They didn't do anything. But Jesus, if you can just speak or move or do something, at least if you minimize what he's going through, life can be more manageable. God did not call you to live a life that you manage your pain. He called you to lay down your burden and watch him roll the stone away. I got about three people say amen to that. I got 300 people that he moved your burden for me. Somebody needs to give God praise for that in Jesus' name. Verse 22, he says, Jesus, oftentimes he throws him into the fire. He throws him into the water. He's trying to burn him alive. He's trying to drown him, and and the enemy wants to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion and help us. Jesus responds to his if with an if. He says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believe. Pastor, how do I see God work a miracle in my life? It's really difficult. Are you ready? You believe. You don't need to know the Greek uh, the, the, Greek, uh, the Greek rendering of the words in the, New Test- uh, in, the, in the New Testament, you don't need to know the Hebrew renderings of the words in the Old Testament. You don't need, here's what you need to do. I've never seen someone drowning have, have to uh, define what it's like to be saved from drowning. Here's what someone drowning does. They go, help! Somebody helps them. You don't need to know all of it. You just need to know that a hand that's bigger than yours is ready to deliver you out of your situation. And that hand is called faith. If you can believe, all things are possible. Pastor, even my situation? Yes, it's possible. To him that believe. And the Bible says straightway the father cried out with tears. Here it is. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Anybody in this room today say, Pastor, I have great faith, but I also have some doubt in my life. Come on. Come on, y'all lying, halo crooked on your horns, looking at me crazy. 
Come on, how many would say, Pastor, I have big faith, but I also am distracted by this big mountain. Pastor, I've seen God move again. It's not that I'm denying or trying to define or trying to put in a category, my God, that he can't do it. But, Lord, I I just don't know if you can move the way that you've moved before. But I'm telling you right now, if you just believe, if you're honest with God, Jesus says, I can if you will. He will not leap over principle to perform a miracle for your life. He says, if you have faith, without it, it's impossible to please me. I can heal if you believe. I can deliver if you believe. I can move mountains if you believe. I'm crazy enough to believe that the faith that we have in God, it has nothing to do really with us. It has everything to do with transitioning us of looking at our current situation and predicament and rather focusing on the hill. The prophet said, my eyes look to the hills from where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I get my eyes off the mountain and I get my eyes on the maker. Hello, somebody. I can, if you will. Where there is an if in front of an obstacle, there's a faith that can move it. I'm going to say that again. If there's an if in front of an obstacle, there's a faith that can move it. Matthew 17 and 20 says, Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, verily I say to you, if you have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, speak to this mountain. Pastor, um, here's the thing. I've tried to do that, and it doesn't work. He didn't say speak one word to the mountain. He didn't just say, say hello to the mountain or goodbye to the mountain. He said speak to it. That, that, if, you, if you look that and it renders out, it means keep talking until you see something happen. God, I speak to this mountain. I don't hear any rumblings. I don't hear any cracking. I don't hear any foundation shifting. I don't hear any movement. Okay, Father, I speak to this mountain. Okay, I, don't still, I still don't see it moving. Hey, uh, Elder Dick Morris, okay, I'm going to grab his hand. And because you said in your word there were two or three agree as touching on earth that, that anything that we need is going to be given to us. And so, okay, God. Hey, Mr. Dick Morris, can you agree with me for this mountain? He says, yes, I agree with you for this mountain. Okay, Father, we agree. Mountain move. Mountain doesn't do anything. What do you do? Do you give up or do you keep talking to the mountain? Here's where the enemy comes in. He says, look, you spoke to the mountain. It must be something in your life that you've fallen short of faith. And so don't even worry about it. Just let the mountain be there. I'll just paint a picture over it so it doesn't look as obvious. You can live with that mountain in your life. You can live all the days of your child not really being saved. You don't worry about the healing going on in your life. You can handle this mountain. But I need people at Gulf Coast to refuse to live with something planted in your life that doesn't belong. I'm planted like a tree by rivers of living water and so where mountains get in front of me I get stronger and I look at everything on the, uh, in front of me and I say God I thank you that you still move mountains I thank you that you still cause walls to fall I thank you that healing is coming in my life I thank you that we will be debt free in Jesus name pastor how can you keep talking when nothing's happening because just because I don't see it in the natural doesn't mean it's not happening in the spiritual something is moving in your life It's moving. Abraham goes up one side of the mountain. And he's like, I don't know why God asked me to sacrifice my only son, but I'm just going to do it because I believe you by faith. Abraham's going up one side of the mountain in Genesis uh, 22. And the Bible says that as he gets to the top of the mountain, he raises his hand to slew his only son. And the Bible says a ram is caught in the thicket. What am I telling you? While Moses was going up one side of the mountain, God was sending the ram on the other side of the mountain. While Moses was walking by faith on the left side, God was sending the answer on the right side. You may not see it right now, but provision is coming your way in the name of Jesus. Healing is coming your way in the name of Jesus. Faith is rising in the name of Jesus. Somebody shout, if. Well, there's an if in front of an obstacle. There's a faith that can move it. Here it is. Your mountain today can be your momentum tomorrow. (laughs) Your mountain today, the obstacle that blocked your view, can catapult you in to your future promise in the name of Jesus. This is hard to believe, but sometimes I can be hard to deal with. 
Y'all didn't have to laugh that hard. Sometimes, just sometimes, I can be hard to deal with. And there's something, it's a medical diagnosis. It's when people get hungry, they, they combine the word hungry and angry, and it's called hangry. How many know what I'm talking about? Yeah, don't look at me like that. Your spouse is the same way. You just can't say anything right now. And, and I have a problem. Round about lunchtime at about 11.15 or so, I get up so early, my, my children get up at the butt crack of dawn. I don't know if I can say that, but I just said it. And so, so here I am getting up super early, and I get hungry, and I get angry. And my wife decides to schedule a all-day get-up-early, come-back-late trip to Disney. And she says to me, should I even schedule this trip? I said, what do you mean? Of course. She says, what if you do what you always do? I said, what is that supposed to mean? You know what you do. What if it comes 11 o'clock and you get hungry and we're standing in line and there's an hour wait for a ride and you're standing there and the kids are there and they're complaining, are you going to do what you always do? I said, the audacity, Carissa, (laughs) for you to ask me that question. I am a man of God. I live in love and joy. And it doesn't matter to me if I've had lunch. I'm going to serve my family with gladness. And have you ever had a conversation with your spouse where they didn't say anything, but you knew what they were saying? (laughs) That's what happened. And so guess what? We went to Disney. And we stood in the line. And I was hungry. And I was angry. Because who in their right mind stands in line for an hour and a half for a five-second ride? And and, and so I'm like, okay, but you know what, Lord? I'm going to set my face like flint because now... I'm going to prove to my wife that her what-if questions can change for my future in Jesus' name. I was still cranky. But then I walked around the corner, and I saw the castle. And I said, God, I know that I'm not supposed to believe in magic, but this place is magical. And something, I think, I think Disney... I think Disney has like their version of the Holy Ghost and they just like, it just speaks to you some way. I don't know. It's like witchcraft or something. I don't know. I shouldn't, I shouldn't even say that. But, but so I walk around and I see the castle and I'm like, all of a sudden I forgot I was hungry anymore. This place is magical. I'm taking selfies and I don't take selfies. Men don't take selfies. What am I, my camera just went out and I took a picture of myself. What am I doing? How many have been to Disney? You know, you know what I'm talking about. Y'all lying if you, you know what I'm talking about. I let her what if, I let her what if change my what if. What am I telling you, folks? We have to let God's what if change our what if. Chris has said, what if for one day you just be normal? And so I took her challenge, and I was normal. And guess what, folks? For those of you that are not normal, it's actually a pretty cool place to be. You don't have to always live there. Just hang out there for a little bit, and, you know, you can fool people. Somebody shout if. Let me get back to the word of God. Matthew chapter 9. If you're with me, shout I'm with you. If you're watching online, somebody comment Disney in the comment section below. Matthew 9, 20 through 22. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood. Somebody say 12 long years. Came behind Jesus and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, she didn't even tell everybody around her. Something inside of her knew that Jesus could change everything. She said to herself. If I may just touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. Jesus turned about. When he saw her, the crowd was pressed against him. There's no possible way that he could have known who touched him. And he said, who touched me? Disciples said, Jesus, there's no way you could know. He said, no, 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 no. Somebody touched me. And the Bible says when he saw her, he says, daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith has made 
you whole. And the Bible says the woman was made whole from that hour. It started with an internal dialogue for her to say, if I can just touch Jesus, everything is going to change. Well, I heard one preacher say it this way. I'm going to adopt it. If Jesus touches us, we are healed. If we touch Jesus, we are made whole. I'm going to say that again. If Jesus touches us, we are healed. And how many would be thankful for that? But if we reach out by faith and we touch Jesus, then we are made whole. His holiness brings our wholeness. This woman with an issue of blood 12 long years pondered what would happen if she saw Jesus. Watch this. Her issue of 12 years was longer than the track record of the healing of Jesus on the earth. He was only healing people for three years. She had had this issue for 12 years. What do you do when it looks like even the one who can solve it doesn't have the ability to solve it? She wasn't focused on history. She was focused on the future because God does not call us to be hypothetical. He calls us to be holy. I'm going to say that again. God does not call us to be hypothetical. He calls us to be holy. Hypo hypothetical living says it's an assumption based on lo logic involving an idea or a theory. But God says, why don't you be holy as I am holy? Why don't you look at your situation and say, if God is in me, this mountain can be moved in Jesus name. Somebody shout amen to that. If is a small word filled with a big possibility. When we live according to his holiness, I've come to understand that our questioning turns into confidence, not in us, but the finished work of the cross of Jesus. Let me read this because it's going to bless you. If you're ready, shot, I'm ready. ready. Psalm 124. If... It had not been, Psalm 124, if it had not been for the Lord on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, they had swallowed us up quick and their wrath was kindled against us. The water had overflowed us. The stream had gone over our soul. The proud waters had gone over our soul. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Verse number eight, the maker of heaven and earth. That psalm starts out with, if it had not been for the Lord on our side. Let me ask you this question. Where would you be if it had not been for the Lord on your side? I want you to think back over the landscape of your life, and I want you to consider and ponder that moment. If God wasn't on your side, where would you be? And if he was there then, guess what? He's here now, and he's going to be there in the future. Come on, give him a praise in the house today. We sit around, and we, you know, we, our job is to make decisions in faith as a staff and as an elders board, and my response typically to the staff is this. When they say, well, what if it doesn't happen? I say, let's remember that God goes before us. If God doesn't go before us, then I'm not going. If God isn't with us now, then I don't want to be right where I'm at. He goes before us. And if that isn't enough, I want you to listen to this last if question. Worship team, come on and run up here. Give these people hope that I'm going to finish, okay? Romans chapter 8. Please don't miss it. Please don't miss this. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 39. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 39. We're talking about if. If. And we know. Somebody shout, I know. All things work together. The good, the bad, the ugly, the indifferent, the in-between, all things work together for the good of them who love God, that's you, that are called according to his purpose. It's not your purpose, it's his purpose. Because if you don't fulfill your assignment, he'll give, your purpose, he'll give his purpose for you to somebody else. For whom he did foreknow, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, he called. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. What shall we say to all of these things? 
Look at this. Are you seeing this? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? I want you to say that to yourself and make it personal. If God be for me, who can be against me? If God be for me. Who, what if you woke up every morning and said, if God be for me, who can be against me? What if you looked at your situation and said, if God be for me, who can be against me? What if you looked at all the people that doubted you and said, if God is for me, I don't care if you're against me. Because if God is for Gulf Coast, it doesn't matter who's against us in Jesus' name. He spared not his own son. He delivered him uh, for us all uh, who lays things in charge of God's elect. Who is he that condemneth? It's Christ who died. And he goes down, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? No. Shall distress? No. Shall persecution? No. Famine? Nope. Nakedness? No. Peril? No. Sword? No. As it is written, we are killed all day long. We are sheep led to the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors to him that loved us. For I am persuaded. How many of you are persuaded today? That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principality, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. What am I saying? If God is for us, who can be against us? Everybody stand on your feet here today. If is a small word full of big possibilities. Romans 8 gives us four proofs. Proof one is this. God will graciously give you all things. Proof number two is this. No one can bring charge against you. Proof three is this, no one will condemn you. And proof four is this, nothing will separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. I'm going to say that again. Proof one, how do I know that God is for me? God will graciously give you all things. Proof two, nobody will bring charge against you. Proof three, no one will condemn you. And proof four, nothing will separate us from the love of God. I'm going to ask you some if questions real quick. What if you leave healed today? What if you leave set free today? What if God restores all that the enemy has stolen from your life? What if, what if when you leave and you make that phone call and when you came to church, something was different and now you made the phone call and everything changed? What if one prayer could change everything? Pastor, I don't know if that's possible. One cross changed everything. One tomb changed everything. One man changed everything. One prayer today can change everything. But you have to decide if I love my life and I love my mountain more than I love the God who created me. Because I want to be real with some of you in this room today. Some of us have looked at that mountain so long that it's built into the landscape and the fabric of our minds and the enemy has convinced you that it's part of the decor of your destiny. God is saying today, I've never designed an obstacle in your life. I've only allowed obstacles to become opportunities for you. Faith will move mighty mountains. Every head bowed, every eye closed in this room today. I'm going to ask you the easiest question I've ever asked you. What if today you responded by faith and everything changed? What if today you responded in worship and everything changed. What if today, instead of talking about your mountain, you talk to your mountain? What if? Okay, everybody, look at me. If you are in this room today and you say, Pastor, I want to get rid of some mountains in my life 
and I can't do it without Jesus and without faith. And I need some people beside me that have seen some mountains move in their own life. If that's you, you say, Pastor, I just want to praise God in advance for things shifting and changing in my life. Come on and join me in this altar and let's worship. People are moving. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. What if? What if you take a step today? What if you didn't plan on it? But what if you decided, I'm going to step out in faith today? Get as close as you can to this altar. If you're watching online, come on, type in if, 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 if. Come on, you got to make up in your mind, this is not just another Sunday. Come on. I'm telling you, I feel faith rising in this room. This is not just another Sunday. This is not just another altar call. This is not just another prayer. This is not just another moment. I don't care what anybody else does. I've got to get to Jesus. I got to get through the crowd to get to Jesus. God, I'm thankful that you healed me, but I'm after being whole today. Get out of my way. I got to get to Jesus. Come on, I'll run through a troop and leap over a wall. I've got to get to Jesus.